So hello everyone. Uh, tonight we're talking about the murders of uh, Clyda Delaney and Nancy Warren, who were in Ukiah, and this happened in 1968. And it's another murder associated with the Manson family because of the Mendocino witches incident that we get into later. Excellent. Yeah, it's the power settings on my computer. It's crazy, but yeah, I've, I've uh, yeah hopefully worked out how to make it not fire up so often. <laughs> So it's a gaming computer, but I don't need the amount of processor that it's got, so the fan doesn't need to be kicking in as much. We'll sort that out. <laughs> Might be some of the same girls. We'll get into that, won't we, later? <laughs> yeah, but they called them the Witches of Mendocino, didn't they? Right. And uh, Clyde Delaney, Clyde Jean Delaney was born on the 24th of August 1944 in Stanislaus County, CA. They moved to Ukiah, CA. She married a local logger, John Ussery. They quickly had three sons. At some point, they moved away from Ukiah. However, Clyde departed from Ussery and returned to Ukiah with her three boys. By October 1968, 24-year-old Clyde had remarried. Her second husband was a California Highway Patrol officer, Donald Delaney, aged 49. He was some years older than Clyde's father. Delaney shared his apartment in Ukiah with his teen daughter. A realtor was looking for a four-bedroomed house for Delaney to buy so the family of seven could be united under a single roof. And Clyde was eight months pregnant. And Nancy Warren, as her grandmother, was prominent in the Ukiah business community. She owned Nancy's Antiques, which was located south of Ukiah on Highway 101. Clyde, Clyde's grandfather, owned Warren's trailer sales on North State Street in Ukiah. Clyde was temporarily living in a trailer next to her grandmother's home with her three sons at the time of their murders, which was October the 14th, 1968. Now we get to uh, what happened to him. Sorry about that, cat just knocked something off. On the rainy morning of October the 14th, 1968, six miles north of Ukiah, a seven-year-old boy ran out of his trailer home and found his mother dead on the wet ground outside the front door. The boy ran for his grandmother's trailer nearby. She was dead too rotted like the boy's mother with a pair of long boot laces. The dead women are Nancy Warren, 64, and her granddaughter, Clyde Jean Delaney, 24, wife of California Highway Patrol Officer Don Delaney. Clyde was eight months pregnant. The seven-year-old was John Ussery, whose younger brothers, Lane, five, and Brett, four, were still asleep. The three boys were from Clyde's first marriage to a logger named John Ussery of Eugene, Oregon. Clyde had left Usury for Don Delaney, a Ukiah-based California Highway Patrol officer, twice her age. She was pregnant with Delaney's child when she was murdered. Clyde's former husband was quickly eliminated as a suspect when it was verified that he'd been in Medford, Oregon at the time of the murders. Finding his mother and grandmother dead, Johnny had calmly returned to the trailer, got his younger brothers dressed, and then his two little brothers, in tow, the three boys, trudged south to the home of Don Terrell, where Johnny told Mr and Mrs Terrell that Mommy and Grandma are dead. A swarm of deputies led by Sheriff Reno Bartholomew was soon on the scene. The sole witness to the previous night's mayhem, which occurred in the driving rain that obliterated the footprints, assumed to have surrounded Clyde Delaney's outdoor corpse, was Mrs. Warren's miniature dash hound. The two dead women were fully clothed. They'd been brutally beaten about the face before they'd been strangled with brand new high top leather boot laces, two turns of which had been pulled tight around the neck before the laces were knotted in back. Mrs. Warren operated Nancy's Antique Sales on Highway 101, south of Burke Hill, on the two-lane portion of the highway, about where the strawberry fields and sales stand are today. Clyda Delaney was a graduate of Yukai High School, who only months before had left her husband, Officer Delaney, 49, a man several years older than her father. Had left her husband for Officer Delaney. Right. So yeah, you see these two women were strangled with leather boot laces and one of the women was pregnant. So you can see how people connect that to the Manson family because uh, of a pregnant woman being choked with something, you know, strangled with something straight away. And uh, there is another article where they say more about the murders. Uh, what well, now at first law enforcement wasn't looking at the Manson family. As noted in the article shown above, the Sheriff's Office was looking for three white men in a 1958 white Plymouth station wagon 
with paper plates, which was seen driving away from Warren's antique shop on Highway 101. This shop was owned and operated by Nancy Warren, and the three men were seen leaving the shop at about 8am on the day the bodies were discovered in or near two trailers behind the shop. The car headed south on Highway 101, but soon developed a flat tyre, giving the witness a chance for another look. Later that day, a Hopland waitress reported seeing the same three men getting out of a station wagon, make a model unknown. She said one of them told the other two, we will get away with this one, the same as we did in Oregon. The descriptions given, person of interest one, male with bright red hair of average length, meaning pretty short in 1967, 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 10 inches tall, slightly built, early 20s. Person of interest two, male with light brown long hair, medium build, early 20s. Person of interest three, male with dark hair and two or three days growth of beard, six feet tall and huskily built. However, none of the three were identified to the public or arrested. And there's another picture of Clyder with her first husband. Clyder's former husband was given a hard look as well since he was known to be abusive and had done time for assault. By coincidence, apparently, he did time in Vacaville while Charles Manson was locked up there. According to his son, Johnny, the elder Ussery was part of a group of men who walked by Manson while he was sweeping the floor, his job at the time. Ussery called out to him, asking Manson who had done that thing in Ukiah. Reportedly, even though he couldn't have known which member of the group had shouted at him, Manson turned around and looked Ussery in the eye before answering, you'll never know, will you? At any rate, Ussery was quickly eliminated as a suspect when several witnesses verified the fact that he'd been seen in Medford, Oregon at the time of the murders. The next logical suspect was the father of Clyde's unborn daughter, Don Delaney. Four times out of five, when a woman is murdered, it's by a man in her life, usually a husband or boyfriend. This was the next theory pursued by, detec by the detective in charge of the case, Earl Friend. According to the investigator, currently assigned to Ukiah's cold cases, Earl Friend thought Don Delaney might have hired someone to do the killings. He was, after all, twice Clyde's age at 49 and several years older than her father. On the day the bodies were found, however, Delaney was in Sacramento for a special California Highway Patrol officer training course. Delaney told the sheriff's office that he dropped his wife and stepsons off at Nancy's antique shop at 9.30 the previous night, a Sunday, and intended to continue on to Sacramento, but he'd forgotten his uniform, so he returned to his Ukiah apartment, picked up the uniform, and then drove into Sacramento by a Highway 20 East. He signed in at the academy there at 1.45am, which wasn't good enough since the coroner could not pinpoint the time of death and said it could have happened any time between 10pm and midnight. For his part, Delaney appeared to be truly distraught about all this, and he had been actively searching for a larger house so that there would be room for him, Clyder, her three, front, three sons and their unborn baby girl, and a teenage daughter from, his, from an earlier marriage. On the other hand, an instant family of seven is a lot more grief, responsibility and expense than taking care of a single teenager. On still another hand, a couple of years after this, he married someone else, a woman 19 years his junior, with three little girls, so stepkid seems unlikely to have been that big of a problem for Delaney. Well, and this is the only picture I've found of the boys, all three of the boys. In any case, the motive didn't seem to be money. A small cash box had been rifled in Nancy Warren's trailer, but a small glass jar containing $300 was left in plain sight on a counter and unmolested. Mrs. Warren's purse was emptied on the floor, but no jewellery was missing, nor anything else of much value. What's more, blood recovered from beneath Nancy Warren's fingernails was the wrong type to be Don Delaney's DNA. Might have provided an answer, but the DNA might have provided an answer, but the technology wasn't well developed as a forensic tool back then, and by the time the evidence was analysed for it, any DNA present had long since deteriorated. No financial evidence of payment to a hitman has ever been mentioned either. That's another picture of Clyder and her oldest son, Johnny. Well, if Clyder's ex and Clyder's new man hadn't done it, then who? The sheriff's office interviewed 35 suspects, including a trio of roaming purse snatchers. The three men in the white station wagon, perhaps. Sheriff Bartolome later said that he thought the three transients could have murdered the two women, but without any evidence, he couldn't hold them and they soon departed his jurisdiction. What did catch the eye of one investigator was the method of murder. Both women were fully clothed when found and neither had been sexually assaulted. They had, however, been badly beaten about the face before being strangled with a brand new high-top leather boot laces. 
One party says that two turns of each thong have been pulled tight around the victim's neck before the laces were knotted in the back. Another reports an unlikely total of 36 laces being used on each woman. More likely the laces were 36 inches long. In fact, the laces were 36.5 inches long and therefore not a standard length sold in stores. Other than that, however, there wasn't much to go on. Any shoe prints had been washed away by the rain. No useful fingerprints were found and there was no stolen property to be tracked down. So the case went nowhere. But a year on down the road, the news was full of reports on the Tate Larbianca murders in LA, where the victims were also beaten and tied up, and some of them partially strangled, and one of them was eight months pregnant, just like Clyder. Lo and behold, there was also proof of the Manson family's continued presence in the Mendocino area during the fall of 1968, and a witness had reported seeing another vehicle leaving the area of the antique shop on that cold rainy, rainy morning in October, a beat-up old blue trick pickup truck with five hippie types in it. And there's another magazine article. There are a couple of magazine articles there. I'll put the link to this article in the description. Among, among other things, it took months for the witches to wend their way back through the court system. Oh, well, I, I won't read all this out now because I've still got to get into the rest of the medicine of witches thing. Right. So, any comments so far? Susan used to wear high knee boots that would have required those things of laces, yeah. Mm. Yeah, nothing was taken as well. Yeah. Because, see, a lot of the, what strikes me is uh, the Manson family do seem to do stuff for revenge. That seems to be like their main motive for doing stuff if you look into what the real sort of motives appear to be. And when we get into what they might have been trying to take revenge for here. But I also think, no, it does seem a bit extreme. But yeah, I'll let you judge. Right, I'm going to go back to this. Aha, uh -huh. right. So, right, this is the Mendocino witches, as you say. Right, uh, so we get. Patricia Cranwinkle, Mary Bruner, Ella J. Bailey, Susan Scott, and Susan Atkins. Right? And now, if you're here, most of you probably know who Mary Bruner, Patricia Cranwinkle, and Susan Atkins are, right? Patricia Cranwinkle and Susan Atkins were both convicted for CLO Drive, which is where Sharon Tate was killed. And um, Patricia Cranwinkle also took part in the Lobby Anchors. Mary Bruner was the first ever Manson girl and the father of Mike Bruner, Pooh Bear, the baby Pooh Bear. And you'll hear him called Sundance as well when I read Squeaky's book. That's what they called him. But you probably, you might not know who Ella J. Bailey and Susan Scott are. So I've got a tiny bit to, because uh, Ella J. Bailey is quite interesting. So I've got a bit to read out about her. Apparently, Ella was living in a San Francisco commune on Lyon Street, along with Susan Atkins, when they first met Charlie Manson. Both of them immediately joined his group and took to travelling around in the converted school bus. There isn't much information about what Ella got up to in those days, other than the arrest report from the night she was picked up, along with the other witches. It seems that Ella had a line in the sand that didn't exist for the other girls, or maybe she simply figured things out a lot sooner. By the time of the Tate LaBianca killings, she was long gone. Why? Well, Ella has told other people that she felt Gary Hinman's murder was all her fault, not because she was involved in the killing. She defied Manson, refusing to go along with the group that that, that did the deed. Mary Bruner, Susan Atkins and Bobby Beausoleil. No, Ella felt guilty because it was her that told Charlie she thought Hinman had some money. Why she thought so, no one has ever explained, because Hinman certainly wasn't living the life of Riley. It was described as possibly being some sort of inheritance and Charlie needed cash to buy June buggies for his helter-skelter helter scheme. In the end, instead of the rumoured 20 grand, the killers came away with Gary's two rattle-trap vehicles and a whopping sum of $27 in cash. When Ella Jo heard about him and death the very next day, she took off, along with Shorty Shay's disappearance. The murder made it clear that the days of family flower power were over, and she wanted none of it. One report has her leaving the Spahn Ranch with Bill Vance that day, but that is probably not true. 
Bill Vance left all right, but with little Patty, Madeline Jane Cottage, and moved to Missouri. There's another picture of her, Joe Bailey. Following Bobby Bowe's conviction, she never looked back. Reportedly, she later married and has two daughters and a son, and probably some grandchildren by now. There's a picture of her later. And this is Susan Scott, who's the other one. Stephanie Gale Rowe, aka Susan Scott. And another mugshot of her there. As noted in the last post, Stephanie Rowe can't be Jane Doe 59, and she's been relocated since then. She's alive and well and no longer part of the family. She also does not want a connection with the family heirs and hired a lawyer when she was contacted, not by me. Maybe she just wants to put it all behind her, the same way Ella J. Bailey has. Or maybe there are still some outstanding issues to consider, such as how these women earned the title of the Mendocino witches and just who might have paid the ultimate price for crossing their paths. Here's one newspaper article on the subject. I'm going to read this out later. Right. And, uh, yeah, he's trying to scrub the arrest report here. Shortly after midnight, on June the 21st, 1968, the resident deputy sheriff in Boonville, California, received a report from Mrs. Ruby Rosenfall of Boonville requesting a sheriff's, sheriff's officer be sent to her home. Mrs. Rose, Rosenthal said she believed someone had given her son, Alan, aged 17, some LSD. A sheriff's deputy was sent to Rose sent to the Rosenthal residence and observed Alan to be shaking, nervous and complaining of seeing things, hallucinations, including that his legs looked like snakes and that he saw flashes when he closed his eyes. Alan advised the sheriff's officer that he had received a blue tablet about the size of a baby aspirin from a girl at a hippie house. The sheriff's deputies then went to the residence described by Alan Rosenthal and arrested all the occupants. The residence at this time was occupied by five females, three males and an infant. Among the females was the defendant, Mary Teresa Bruner, and uh, the infant was her son, Michael Manson, a.k.a. Michael Smith. According to Deputy R.E. Yelm, an unknown person or persons in the house admitted to giving the pill, LSD, to the victim and other parties, but stated that they didn't have any more. A search was made of the house and surrounding buildings. An officer found in a woodshed next to the house a small can, approximately two inches tall and one inch round, with the pills in the bottom, and what appears to be marijuana seeds in a plastic sack. Also, in another plastic bag were found more pills, small, bluish in colour. The occupants of the house were transported to the Mendocino County Jail. At a later time, it was confirmed that the seeds found were indeed marijuana, and that the blue capsules found among the other pills were LSD. Another juvenile, Ronnie Wallace, was, appar was also apparently given LSD, but no, char no charges were filed on his behalf. There's a picture of Mary Bruner. Any more recent years. Right. Yeah, so that's what happened, basically. Uh, a mother complained that they'd given, she'd given, that her son had been given LSD. And uh, called the police and they got busted for that. And all arrested. Among other things, it took months for the witches to wend their way through the court system and Manson's son by Mary Bruner, Valentine Michael Manson, had been placed in foster care. Susan Atkins was given probation for her part but promptly violated the terms and spent 90 days in the Mendocino County Jail and Manson was arrested too. So all of that took until at least September 19th to clear up. If anyone stayed on for another three or four weeks, they could have still been in the area when the triple homicide took place. I'm counting the eight months along Fetus as a victim, as she was certainly viable at that point. The non-standard bootlaces also fit into that scenario, since the family was friends with a leather maker in San Jose area by the name of Victor Wilde, and Wilde was known to have made Manson's leathers. So why would the family decide to kill a cop's wife? And would Susan Atkins even be able to take part when she herself is very pregnant? I'm not sure of the exact date, but she gave birth to a baby boy named Zizo Zizo Sadfrak sometimes in October of 1968, and spent time recovering at the Fountain of the World, a nearby religious retreat. So Sexy Sadie, at least, was still in Mendocino County. And that's the Fountain of the World retreat. Well, another story is told by some without any documentation that I've seen. This one says that the California Highway Patrol officers involved in this pulled over a carload of Manson family women on Highway 101 at some point, for driving under the influence of acid, apparently. There was a small child in the car, Valentine Michael Manson, a.k.a. Pooh Bear, one presumes, 
the women were arrested and the child was taken into foster care. Supposedly, the witches got the name of the arresting officer, but the story says that name was Warren, which is definitely wrong. It also claims that his wife's name was Nancy and that Clyder was really the name of the grandma. And then, of course, the two women closest to him, his pregnant wife and grandmother, were killed. No mention is made of the officer Warren's teenage daughter. This version of events says the officer was, was suspected in the killings, but there was not enough evidence to convict him. The Manson family is supposed to have killed the California Highway Patrol officer's pregnant wife in retaliation for taking Charlie's baby away to foster care. Trouble is, there's no record of any official contact between the Manson family and Don Delaney, and all of the names are mixed up. Of course, if there was an incident and the participants were all high on acid, their perceptions and memories of the event might also be highly confused and conflated with the mass arrest that did take place involving the sheriff's office, in which case Manson's kid was removed from his mother. So did they do it? I don't know. As Sheriff Bartholomew once remarked, the murders fell into the senseless category, and it has always been the Manson family's trademark, but no one who does know is saying a word about it. Right. So that's why they think they did it. Because, yeah, they think they, they were taking revenge on the highway patrol officer that got them sent to jail for the summer and got the baby taken into foster care. But I think that take, that seems a bit extreme. And, yeah, and we get to um, Squeaky's book. What a slide have I got? Oh, yes, now I've got these articles to read out. Yeah, there's articles. You can look at these in the Facebook group. It's easier to just read them from your phone. Right. Angry mother triggers county marijuana raid. An irate mother whose uh, son returned home under the apparent influence of LSD triggered a raid by the sheriff's deputies Saturday night, which led to the arrest of nine adults and three juveniles in the Navarro Boonville area on charges of possessing dangerous drugs. Seven of the adults, ranging in age from 18 to 24, were also charged with furnishing dangerous drugs to minors after deputies raided the residence between Boonville and Philo. Arrested for possessing dangerous drugs, principally marijuana and LSD, were Larry White, 18, Donald Blake, 18, Peter Hornbluff, 18, Robert... God, it's hard to read. Booms, oh, Booms, yeah, it's a really weird name, Booms E, maybe. 18, Mary Bruner, 24, Sadie Mae Glass, Susan Scott, 22, Ella Beth Sodder, 23, and Catherine Smith, 20, all of the Navarro Boonville area. Only two of these persons could be termed permanent residents of the area, the others being floaters or hippies, deputies indicated. Three 11-year-old boys were placed in juvenile hall after being picked up by sheriff's deputies on uh, suspicion of possessing and using dangerous drugs. Two and a half month old... Cool, what does that say? God, that was impossible to read. The two and a half month old of, oh, oh, <laughs> was placed in custody... Yeah, they, they must say they must say child of Charles was placed in the custody of the welfare department. Also on Saturday, an eighteen-year-old youth, Mark Toffler, eighteen, of Sunnyvale, and seventeen-year-old uh, companion were arrested, and William in a stolen car and uh, uh, and ch in Willet, sorry, with a stolen car, and charged with on suspicion of possessing dangerous drugs. That's one article. <laughs> Hi, Danny. Yeah. Where is this? Yeah, well, it's, uh, we, Squeaky says this in her book, I think, as well. It gets quite interesting what she says in her book. Oh, God. And the other, the other article is about when they appear in court. Right. Five young women who were scooped up by sheriff's deputies in a recent raid on a Navarro home were in court Thursday with an array of expensive legal talent all court appointed. The young women were dressed to the teeth in comparison to the jail issue blue denims which they have worn in earlier court appearances. 
The five girls charged on three felony counts involving drugs are Mary Teresa Bruner, 24, represented by Hal Bruner, no relation, and George Nelson. Sadie Mae Glutz, 23, represented by Jim Bush. Susan Scott, 22, represented by Leo Cook. Catherine Patricia Smith, 20, represented by Jack Golden. And Ella Beth Cinder, 23, with Tim O'Brien as her attorney. The appointments came after Judge Wayne Burke decided that the five young women uh, could not all be represented by Richard Peterson, the assistant public defender. Motions for separate trials were made on behalf of Miss Bruner and Miss Glutz after they entered pleas of not guilty, and the proceedings were continued until next Thursday. The cases of the other defendants were continued until next Tuesday for plea. A sixth defendant, Robert M. Boomsey of New York, pled guilty to a misdemeanor possession of dangerous drugs and is awaiting sentencing. All of the women are being held in the women's section of the county jail, with the exception of Miss Cinder, who was released on her own reconnaissance to undergo surgery. And there's that there. And yeah, that other bit there, that's just showing yeah, the names of the pe everyone who was arrested, basically. So yeah, that's the details of how they were all busted, anyway. Oh, they went to jail, didn't they? They didn't get away with with acid. Yeah, they they went to jail for distributing the acid. So yeah, maybe it wasn't CIA acid. The CIA were pissed off at them because they were distributing non-CIA acid. <laughs> That's why they went to jail, maybe. That's it. And then, but then we get to Squeaky's book as well, which is interesting. So this is when um, they're staying at Dennis Wilson's house, basically. Still, we felt to be fewer during the day, so when Dennis was gone and others came round, half of us disappeared. Pretty soon we were spending as much time in the shadows as in light. So, a change was in order. Bruce had always wanted to travel and was considering a voyage overseas, so we took action on it. The two Texas college boys, Rob and Juice, set off separately to see California, and Mary took the black bus with Sunstone, Ella, Patty, Stephanie and Sadie to the Mendocino Woods. For a vacation that would last longer than expected. The rest of us remained at the estate. And she talk about Dennis Wilson's house at that point. Yeah, and then this is a suddenly refers to Dean Morehouse. Dean the preacher left the Ukiah woods heading south about the time that the girls in the black bus passed him going north. Since his daughter Ruth was living with us, Dean was welcomed by Dennis to use the guest house. Dean told us that Mary and the girls were travelling in the black bus and had gained a strange reputation. A hitchhiker had told him of witches and a baby goat in a black pirate bus. All I remember is that about a month after the girls left, we got a call. They were in jail. The way I heard it, Sadie had given LSD to some underage boys just before the boys were, were questioned by the neighbourhood police. Small town. Uh, the police had come raiding and found the girls' weed, even though it wasn't in the house. And they had a variety of charges from possession to contributing to the delinquency of minors. Sunstone was handed to Patty during the arrest, since Mary was already on probation. Patty had booked herself into jail with Catherine Smith and her son as Michael. The only potentially good news was that Sadie was at least two months pregnant by one of the young Texans. I was cleaning the kitchen and Charlie was standing in the breakfast room talking to me about when he sentenced talking to me when his sentence broke off and he looked like he was listening then his eyes watered he went to a chair and sat down after a silence he said it's mary i'm thinking of mary for the second time in the three months since sunstone was born mary was separated from him and charlie knew her feelings about it we had considered what we could do none of them had sounded miserable just a little put out at sadie sadie had wanted to do all the talking they'd been having a good time and magic things were happening magic turned into turn Magic tuned in people. Mary had been business minded with a rundown of charges and legal procedures. She said they had a public defender, would wait, go to court and let us know. Charlie's parole officer and his wife had offered to pick up Sunstone from foster care and keep him for the duration of their incarceration. So she was correcting the re record, claiming him as her son and releasing him into their care. Charlie talked to Dennis about bailing the girls out. I caught only part of the conversation. It was a problem. Dennis's money was tied up in investments made by his advisors. He had specified charge accounts, but sometimes bum pocket money from his friends and even from Charlie. I got the impression that Dennis's people considered him irresponsible and untrustworthy to handle his own finances. 
it would later be widely reported that we took Dennis for thousands of dollars. Uh, but we only took what he gave. We didn't press him or the girls would have been out on bail. And three. The five girls spending that summer 500 miles north in jail had gotten so hot that they'd just quit wearing clothes. They were the only prisoners in the women's section. All of their keepers were women. But Charlie's parole officer in San Francisco read a newspaper article about their nuding. The reporter claiming that their calling tactic was a new kind of protest movement. Friends who had visited them stopped by the ranch to tell us that they had lost weight but they looked great and that Patricia was now an exuberant Katie whose song and humour filled the cell block and that uh, while facetiously called a little crazy they were all well regarded by jailers and townsfolk alike. Listening I was struck by the irony that this celebrative spirit was about, <laughs> was about a stint in the county jail. Right. Um, one day on the ranch, Charlie told Brenda and me uh, that it might be a good time for the two of us to take a vacation. He said that we were working too hard for people who were just along for the ride. So I felt we were being cut adrift. Uh, but he borrowed an old convertible for us and my sense of adventure was kindled. We took turns driving a lazy zigzag north, bumming gas at a quarter's worth of station. The convertible didn't actually convert, the top being permanently down. But the weather was warm, so we often wore only bathing suits, stopping at public recreation areas to swim and sleep, and somewhere contacting poison ivy. I have never seen anyone swell up like Brenda did, her delicate face lumping like a monstrous potato head. The cause of this disfigurement was not obvious, and it became difficult to talk, uh, to talk attendance out of gas. For days under the hot sun, Brenda's skin wept. She, sh uh, she shook herself to keep from scratching, and more than once I turned from the road to see tears rolling down her face, but she didn't complain. North of Santa Rosa, we realised where we were going. Uh, on the one hand, it was a might as well idea, but on the other, it seemed suddenly obvious this was what Charlie had in mind. We arrived in the wooded town of Ukiah just a day or two before Mary, Patty, Ella, Sadie and Stephanie went to court and were released, trusted to return for another court date the following month. We had a happy reunion, packed into the convertible, driving in the open air to San Francisco to pick up sunstone. Susan exposed her belly to the sun. She couldn't stop talking about the baby boy she had dreamt was inside it. And thanks to Charlie's parole officer and his wife, sunstone was as sturdy and cute as a bear cub. Charlie was disgruntled to hear us calling sunstone Pooh Bear when he got back to the ranch. He later told me gravely that when sunstone was born, he saw an image of the moon eclipsing the sun. He said women have been overshadowing their children for too long. And so then they all go back to George Spahn's uh, ranch. Yeah, by the time they get out of jail, they've moved to Spahn Ranch. They're out of Dennis Wilson's house, basically. Yeah, so that's all I've got to read out. There's a lot to read out if I want to get it done. But yeah, you can see why people think it is the Manson family. Like, revenge uh, on the police officer that got them sent down. But... <clears throat> It would have been one of many, though, wouldn't it, that would have been involved in the arresting them. And it just seems a bit extreme, I don't know, for them. But I suppose going down, going to jail for months and having your baby taken into care is quite an extreme thing as well, though, isn't it? So that might be why. Oh, yes, I meant to say the pages. I'll have to put that in the description, won't I? What, the last bit I read... Two five three, the ranch. That's where it says about the five girls spending that summer in jail. Oh, I think I threw away the bookmark for the last one that I read out. <laughs> yeah, but it's like towards the uh, from the end of the nineteen sixty eight to sixty nine chapter and the beginning of the like the ranch chapter. Basically, yeah, 253 was one of them. Uh, oh, the last bit, uh, I can't remember. Yeah, I think I threw away the bloody bookmark, didn't I? Three, yeah, because that was number four. Anyway. <laughs> Dennis had more people that made money off him, otherwise he would have ended up like human. 
Yeah, most of them, yeah, a lot of people did. Well, they used him to get into places, didn't they? Because of who he was, used his reputation sort of thing. That does seem to have worked a little bit with the fan. It has made it not fire up so much. Mm. Here's a dark there, the side of that. Yeah, but it's all, it's all around that around that bit. It's not they're not far away, those bits. Because yeah, as soon as they're it's like they're they're at Dennis Wilson's house when they go off on the bus, and then there's a couple of bits in between that, and then they return to the ranch basically. They go and pick them up. But that also shows that people travelled up to meet them when they came out of court, uh, when they got released from jail, and Charlie was up there as well. So who else travelled with them? A text had met them at this point as well. So like, could other people have travelled with them that they're not telling us about? Because obviously Squeaky's not going to tell us everything, is she? And also, it's always said that they were being sent out to recruit other people for the Manson family, but Squeaky doesn't say anything about that in the book. But again, would she if, if they had been told to go out to recruit other members? Mm. But yeah, no, Squeaky just says they just went off on, on a journey because they wanted to, sort of thing. You know. So it's another thing that shows Charlie wasn't that controlling of him, that he would let Mary go off with his son like that. Do you know what I mean? Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and the book is called Reflection. But yeah, well, that's clear from... I had the cover on the screen, didn't I? Everyone knows that. Mm. And that's it. Because, I mean, uh, it's another one. This kind of does sound like it could be them, because this does, this is the sort of thing that they would do for it, someone that would directly wrong them. But I just don't know. It still doesn't seem like them, though. Not... Not police officers, they wouldn't go after it. It was like people that had uh, stung them for drugs, wasn't it? Basically, that they actually ended up murderously going after. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, this is it, was he? And Squeaky's just not saying that, yeah, because Squeaky wouldn't say. And yeah, and it also mentions Bruce Davis going off uh, on a journey. Yeah, it does about, must be the first time he went to London, wasn't it? For Scientology. You go and check out the Bruce Davis Scientology Cottage video. That's where Bruce Davis stayed when he was in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. Well, like I say, it's when Squeaky describes it, she doesn't say Charlie told them to go. They just went, is how she phrases it. Isn't it? And uh, she kind of makes out that they were uh, annoyed at Susan, that it was Susan that caused the problem, sort of thing, given it LSD to young boys. <laughs> but Susan herself was only 18, wasn't she? Or 17 or 18 herself. About 18, 19 at the most, weren't she? So it's not like she was really targeting people that much younger than herself. Yeah. Yeah, and he did. He went to London. Yeah, pretty good overseas. Yeah, well, I say it's what it says when I read out about the Barker Ranch raid. Um, he did send people out to kill Stephanie Schramm and Kitty Lutzinger when they ran away. He says so. Well, yeah, he was. You know, straight. Yeah. Yeah, being the non-team player and eating steak. I've read she used to go to Mama Cass's house and raid her fridge and eat meat because she yeah, <laughs> Charlie wouldn't have to eat meat on the on the ranch sort of thing. Hmm. Tex says one of the first things he did when he got away was eat a burger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think there are any pages of photos in it, are there? But the stuff from Sandy's interesting. I'd like Sandy to write a book herself. But you you find out a little bit more about Sandy in it as well. There's like letters from Sandy, isn't there? And there's other some other people. It is, yeah, it's a, it's a good book. I haven't completely finished it yet. I've got to finish it. I've nearly finished Mama Cass's biography as well. In fact, there's loads more about Pick Dawson. I might even do an update to the Mama Cass streams because that uh, first Mama Cass stream I did was really popular with the more stuff about Pick Dawson. Because very little was known about him. Yeah, and I found another picture of him. If you're in my Facebook group, you should have seen that. <laughs> Still no picture of Billy Doyle there. 
And yeah, it's Sam here. Has, has Dave Mason's book come out yet? Dave Mason's supposed to be publishing a book as well. That'll be interesting. Let's see if he does. Yeah, I'd like to see Sandy write a book. Yeah. Yeah, and it is weird that there's no picture of Billy Doyle. Yeah, yeah, still so many people. And Diane Lake's book, I I ordered it, but it must have got lost in the post. We had loads of the, 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 the mail people went on strike over Christmas, so stuff got lost in the post. I ordered uh, Diane Lake's book and Squeaky's book on the same day, and Squeaky's book arrived really quickly, but the Diane Lake one never arrived, so I've got to order it again, basically. <laughs> I can't afford to order all these books on a really low budget at the moment. So, yeah. Support me by buying me a coffee if you can. <laughs> you can link, that's linked from my channel. And I'll put them in the description. <laughs> if only just a couple of people donate a month, it helps cover the cost of StreamYard and all that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. At the Casco, because there's loads of them. There's, I didn't realise they all were Canadian. Pick Dawson, uh, Charles Tucker, Billy Doyle, and Harrigan. Loads of them. What, the Dave Mason book? Yeah, I'm just about to start a chapter of, of uh, Mama Cassie's book, where she, cause she recorded an album with Dave Mason. It's in that Dave Mason article. So there's a chapter all about that as well. So maybe that will get into more detail about what exactly happened with Billy Doyle and how Billy Doyle ended up managing him. <laughs> Yeah, I recommend that uh, Mama Cassie's biography. You can read that for free as well on the Internet Archive. Yeah, well, that would be good to update on uh, the Mama Cassie thing. Hmm. And also, it's strange Squeaky doesn't mention in her book Charlie going up there and ending up in jail. Uh, she says that he was at Dennis Wilson's house when he heard about them being in jail, was upset because Mary was separated from the baby. But then, So when did he go up there and end up in jail? Because we know he did. Because there's, there's newspaper articles from the time about it. They all ended up in jail. It's called uh, Dream a Little Dream of Me, The Life of Mama Cass, Mama Cass's biography, by Eddie Fiegel, which is spelled weird. <laughs> F-I-E-G-E-L. Eddie Fiegel. And uh, yeah, just if you go to archive.org and just search for it. Yeah. So there's more photos. There's that photo of Pick Dawson. And another photo of her with a Triumph motorcycle. <laughs> Probably the same one that you see opposing. I think so. I think it was, was it 74? Yeah, I think about then. God, sorry, my cat's really getting annoying now. I decided to come and get on my lap just as the stream was starting, didn't you? Yes. Just to be awkward. <laughs> it's um, it's a flat. I think it's a flat that belonged to uh, Mick Jagger, yeah, and Keith Moon died in the same place a few years later, yeah, apparently, which is just weird. Another weird coincidence. Hi, William. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, uh, and uh, she was friends with uh, loads of British pop stars. She liked coming over to Britain. She came over to Britain quite a lot. Was friends with all the rock stars, and she just played at the London Palladium, I think, hadn't she? When she died, was it the same date as well? Though, I don't think it would. That would be too weird, wouldn't it? Surely, yeah. There'd be more fuss made about that. I know it's the same same place, though. Yeah. I don't know if it still belonged to Mick Jagger by the time Keith Moon died in it. I imagine Keith Moon had bought that flat by then, you know, so it's just like the property. Traded hands. Yeah, yeah, I've got to check it out. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, my cat. It's a nightmare, aren't you? Yes. It's a bit dumb as well, aren't you? You're not quite all there. <laughs> I 
Yeah, where is Sam? I haven't seen Sam yet tonight. He's normally here, isn't he, by now? Saying it was the CIA. Yeah, and this does have acid. Acid in it, doesn't it? Yeah. The blue pills. Where, were they? where did they get these blue pills from? Yeah. Okay, I'll catch you later, Mike. Right, we're coming up for an hour now as well. So I could just go to an after stream because we've uh, I finished reading out everything I was going to read out. I hope that was clear. I mean, that's why your computer's in a separate room, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he jumps on the computer keyboard and sits on it and everything. He doesn't know, do you? You don't get it at all. No. <laughs> Sam is out on a job. Yeah, Sam is out on a job, yeah, making sure no one thinks that the CIA didn't do everything. <laughs> someone, 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 someone's not, not heard about a CIA conspiracy theory, so he's making sure everyone's heard. Yeah, I think I'll do that, actually. Yeah, I'll end this now, and I'll go to an after stream, because we have, yeah, read out everything I wanted to read out. So yeah, thanks for coming everyone and come to the after stream if you want to continue chatting. Excellent. See you in a bit everyone and good night and thanks for watching if you're watching this on Playbook.